Greetings, math fanatics of YouTube. This is your boy Kamal once again, and today we have a very interesting integral, like always anyway. But this time it's even more interesting, I guess. It's very cool. We have the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of the inverse tangent of sine theta divided by root sine theta. How do we want to begin the solution development? Well, we're integrating from 0 to pi by 2. We have sine functions involved. We might as well try the substitution that is letting sine theta equal u. This implies that cosine theta d theta equals du, and this further implies that d theta here is du divided by cosine theta. Now, cosine theta would be root 1 minus sine squared theta, and sine theta is just u, so we have root 1 minus u squared. That's how the differential element transforms. And as theta approaches 0, we have u approaching sine 0, which is 0. And as theta approaches pi by 2, we have u approaching 1. So i in the u world is now an integral from 0 to 1, which is pretty nice. We have integral 0 to 1, inverse tangent u, divided by root u. And of course, we have du and this factor of 1 minus u squared in the denominator as well. What I'm about to do now might not seem very intuitive at first sight, but, you know, hindsight is 2020. Let me walk you through the steps. We first try a bunch of things to solve the integral that don't work. Then you just go to the corner of your room and cry for a while. Then you question your life decisions. Then you hit the gym. And after having a killer workout, you're obviously going to feel better. So you're back home, you shower, etc., etc., and then you sit back down at the problem. And then you're like, yo, something could work over here. And the motivation for that is that we're integrating from 0 to 1. We have factors like u and 1 minus u squared, meaning that we have 1 plus u and 1 minus u. And whenever you have structures like these, the wire stress substitution can be quite useful. It's often quite helpful here. So what if we try letting 1 minus u divided by 1 plus u equal to z. Now, this has the benefit of the function being self-inverse. What I'm trying to say is the function f of z, defined as 1 minus z divided by 1 plus z, is its own inverse. That means whatever rule we have for z in terms of u is the same thing we have for u in terms of z. So that's how the 1 plus u, 1 minus u, and the u terms will sort out, and the differential element is pretty easy to calculate under these circumstances as well. So differentiating, we have du equal to, let's see, we got 1 plus z times negative 1, minus 1 minus z times 1, we got 1 plus z squared in the denominator. We do some simplifications, I think we got, yeah, these two canceling out, so we got negative 2, I forgot the dz, negative 2 dz divided by 1 plus z squared. And another benefit of this transformation is that it maps the interval from 0 to 1 onto the interval from 0 to 1. So you can verify that the, that the limits are still 0 and 1. However, the limits are switched up. So we have now the integral from 1 to 0. Let me just give myself some writing space by minimizing this just a little bit. And there we go. Okay, cool. So this implies that we have i now equal to the negative of the integral from 1 to 0 of the inverse tangent of 1 minus z divided by 1 plus z divided by root u. Now what exactly would u be? That was 1 minus z divided by 1 plus z. Then we have 1 minus u squared. So that's 1 minus 1 minus z squared divided by 1 plus z squared, and the differential element is negative 2 divided by 1 plus z whole thing squared dz. And wait a minute, I already accounted for that negative sign out here. Okay, cool. So if we switch up the limits of integration, we get rid of the extra negative sign outside, so we have integral 0 to 1 now, a factor of 2 outside because it's just a constant, and then we have the inverse tangent 
of 1 minus z divided by 1 plus z. I know what you're thinking, this looks awful, but believe me, it only gets better from here. After all, the best way to simplify things is to make them more complicated. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Anyway, so what do we have? We have 1 minus z divided by 1 plus z all in a square root. Then we have 1 plus z squared minus 1 minus z squared divided by 1 plus z whole thing squared again. And of course we have dz divided by 1 plus z squared. We immediately spot some nice cancellations taking place. So we have twice the integral from 0 to 1 of the inverse tangent of 1 minus z divided by 1 plus z divided by 1 minus z divided by root 1 plus z and for these two over here what do we get we would have four times z as the surviving term if i remember much algebra okay so i don't i haven't forgotten all of it so we have two times root z divided by 1 plus z and we have dz divided by 1 plus z whole thing squared now we have some cancellation taking place and there can be further cancellation of this thing with the remaining 1 plus z term. So that would give us, oh, the 2's cancel out as well. We now have integral 0 to 1 inverse tangent of 1 minus z divided by 1 plus z divided by, now in the square root, we have z times 1 minus z times 1 plus z integration with respect to z. And of course, the denominator can be written as z times 1 minus z squared. So we have i here finally equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of the inverse tangent of 1 minus z divided by 1 plus z divided by root z times 1 minus z squared dz. Okay, I do admit that this looks slightly worse, or maybe exponentially worse than the integral we started with because... We're back to the same limits of integration. We have the same function in the denominator, but instead of the inverse tangent of u or z, whatever, we have the inverse tangent of 1 minus z divided by 1 plus z. But that's actually a lot better to work with. How on earth is that a lot better to work with? Well, I did learn a couple of tricks from my undergrad, perks of being self-taught in a third world country. So... One trick I did learn was to spam the tangent of a plus b formula. And there were a number of times I had to do that. So here's an example. We're given 1 minus z divided by 1 plus z. This could be expanded or translated or masked or whatever you want to call it as the tangent of pi by 4 minus the tangent of the inverse tangent of z. Yeah, that sounds perfectly fine. And in the denominator, we could write this as 1 plus the tangent of pi by 4 times the tangent of the inverse tangent of z. Wow, so that means we have the tangent of pi by 4 minus the inverse tangent of z equal to 1 minus z divided by 1 plus z. So that means the inverse tangent of the left-hand side equals this thing on the right-hand side, which is quite nice. It is indeed incredibly nice because we have i now equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of pi by 4 minus the inverse tangent of z divided by root z times 1 minus z squared dz. Now separating the terms upstairs and using the linearity of the integration operator, we have the integral from 0 to 1 of pi by 4 divided by root z times 1 minus z squared dz minus the integral from 0 to 1 of the inverse tangent of z, terribly sorry about that, divided by root 1 minus z squared times z, of course, so that's z times 1 minus z squared dz. And this thing here, terribly sorry about that, is the integral i. So that means just adding i to both sides of the equation, then expanding by 1 half gives us i here now equal to pi divided by 8 
times the integral from 0 to 1 of dz divided by root z times 1 minus z squared. And this is actually a very simple integral to evaluate. All we need is a substitution of letting z here equal to, let's say, the sine of t, which implies that dz here equals cosine t dt. So i now equals pi by 8 times the integral from 0 to, let's see, for z approaching 1, we have t approaching pi by 2, and we have cosine t dt divided by root sine t times what exactly? We have 1 minus sine squared t, which of course is cosine squared t, so that thing should cancel out with the cosine term in the numerator, so we have integral, we have pi by 8 times the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of dt divided by root sine t, and this of course can be solved using the beta function. We in fact have pi by 16 times twice the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of sine to the negative one half of t and we have cosine to the zero of t dt. Okay, cool. So the beta function in the geometric form with complex arguments u and v equals twice the integral from zero to pi by two of sine to the two u minus one of t times cosine to the two v minus one of t dt. So if you compare the exponents, we have u equal to a quarter and v here equal to one half. So that means that the integral i is in fact pi by 16 times the beta function at a quarter and a half. Now translating this into the gamma function, we have pi by 16 times gamma first argument of the beta function times gamma second argument divided by gamma sum of the arguments, so we have a quarter plus a half here. Gamma one half is famously equal to root pi, so we have pi times root pi divided by 16. We have gamma one quarter divided by gamma three quarters. And of course, using the reflection formula, gamma three quarters can be expressed in terms of gamma one quarter. Since we have gamma one quarter times gamma three quarters, equal to gamma one quarter, terribly sorry about that, times gamma one minus one quarter. So that means applying the reflection formula, we in fact have pi divided by the sine of pi times the argument, in this case being a quarter, so we have pi by four. And this implies, terribly sorry about that, that the reciprocal of gamma three quarters, that's the term we have, in fact equals gamma quarter times sine of pi by four, which is, wait, uh, yeah, that's one by root two, perfect, and divided by pi. Or we could just write this as pi times root two, perfectly fine. Now plugging this into the final result, we finally have the integral i equal to pi times root pi divided by 16. And we now have gamma squared at one quarter divided by pi times root two. So the pi's cancel out. We're still left with root pi over there. And we could express the result in terms of the Lemniskid constant, but you know what? I'm just gonna leave it like this for now. I could expand using root two, so I can write this as root two pi divided by 32 times gamma squared one quarter. And of course you could express this in terms of the lemniskate gate constant as well, but I just like the gamma squared one quarter term in itself. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something from the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Do drop me a follow on Instagram. And in case you like the channel and the effort I'm putting out, consider supporting me on Patreon. All links in the description box. Thank you. See you next time.